Hello, welcome to this latest edition in our video interview series here at iConnect. My name is Richard Albert, and today I'm joined by two friends, dear friends, uh, Adam Perry and Farah Ahmed. Adam is an associate professor at the University of Oxford, and Farah is also an associate professor at Melbourne Law School. We're all classmates, as it happens, uh, at Oxford many years ago, and I've invited Adam and Farah to join me today to talk about an interesting, fascinating subject in public law, the notion of a constitutional statute. Yeah. Adam, Farah, welcome. Thanks, Thanks Richard. Thank Happy to be here. Well, it's good to have both of you uh, here for this, uh, for, for this conversation on two of your recent papers, uh, co-authored papers that you both have written. The first is on the quasi-entrenchment of constitutional statutes, and the other is on constitutional statutes. I will link to both papers um, uh, in the post that uh, publishes this particular video interview so our readers can have a look at both papers. But let's begin uh, at the beginning. What is a constitutional statute? And here I want to note that you're writing in a particular context, aren't you? You're writing in the context of the British Constitution. That's, should, I, should I kick it off for a yeah, please do. Yeah, um, yeah, that's right, Richard. We're uh, we're focusing on constitutional statutes um, in Britain, and um, and we're interested in this topic because uh, constitutional statutes have lately been a a matter of um, of attention by UK courts. Um, they started to treat constitutional statutes, especially um, for various purposes. And so there's been a attention to interest in this question of, well, what makes a statute constitutional? Because if we can answer that question, then we'll know um, which statutes have to be treated differently for these legal reasons. Um, and so in the second paper you mentioned, the one just titled Constitutional Statutes, Far and I try to set out an, an account of uh, what a constitutional statute is and some of the conditions that make a statute constitutional. Um, and so the starting point for our account is uh, the discussion of the sort of um, uh, the subject matter that a uh, statute has to have, has to cover for it to be constitutional. So one of the things that we think that a statute has to do um, to be constitutional is to, to create or to regulate in some way um, a state institution. Um, and that could be um, the Scottish Parliament or it could be... Um, the UK Supreme Court. Um, so that's the starting point, and then we try to develop uh, the second part, the second condition, which is uh, that a statute has to be of a certain importance, has to matter in a certain way. So that subject matter condition and an importance condition, and those two conditions together identify uh, which statutes are constitutional, according to us. So you have in the paper on constitutional statutes, you propose a, a series of criteria uh, that allow us to identify, at least at a, at a high level of abstraction, uh, what a constitutional statute is. And I say a high level of abstraction. Um, do, you, do you agree? Because it's not clear that everyone would apply the criteria in the same way. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that's, that's right. So, um... So I think there's probably, so as I say, there's these two conditions, um, one about, about what's regulated and then one about this sort of importance of a statute within the broader legal system. Um, what kind of difference does it make to what state institutions can and may do? And we want to say that it has to be of a certain degree of importance for it to qualify as constitutional. But um, you're going to get some argument and um, reasonable disagreement about um, the ways in which statutes are important and the kind of differences they make and which differences are more important than which others. Um, and that's going to be sort of a, the beginning of an argument. And so we confess, we, we fess up in the paper that we don't have a, um, a foolproof guide to which statutes are constitutional and which don't, aren't. What we have instead is um, a starting point. Um, a series of questions that people need to ask themselves and criteria that they need to apply to determine which statutes are constitutional and which aren't. 
So what are some examples of constitutional statutes as you identify them? Right, that's a good question. So, um, so I mentioned at the beginning that uh, the one reason why people are interested in constitutional statutes in Britain these days is that courts have been paying attention to, to constitutional statutes and been starting to treat them differently. And so some of the, the statutes that they've treated specially um, are the, the European Communities Act, which um, provides a kind of gateway for European Union law to apply in Britain. That's one constitutional statute, hugely important. Um, it's basically this, the major way that EU law has an impact in the UK. Um, another constitutional statute that courts have treated specially is uh, the Scotland Act, which devolves power to Scotland, creates a government for Scotland, creates a parliament for Scotland, and in that way has given rise to a huge number of, um, of statutes that apply in Scotland. So a huge amount of, of further law. Um, and then a third example would be the Human Rights Act in Britain, which um, is the, the major human rights instrument and gives expansive powers to courts to protect and uphold human rights. So those would be three examples. Um, but you also, I mean, so those are all statutes dating from 1972 or after. You also get constitutional statutes from much further back. So Magna Carta 1215 would be a constitutional statute. And the Bill of Rights 1689 would also be a constitutional statute. And these are constitutional statutes, again, going back to those criteria I mentioned, partly because they create and regulate important state institutions, um, like, say, the executive. And also, the, the play a pivotal role within the, the British legal system. And what about the Parliament Act of uh, 1911? Would that count as one in your, in your framework? Yeah, that's an interesting example. Um, so it's, uh, it, it's a constitutional statute by virtue of um, regulating um, two of the most important institutions in the British legal system. That's the House of Commons and the House of Lords, and it regulates their interaction. And it does so in a, in a pivotal way. Um, it provides a, a way of breaking a, a deadlock between these two institutions when they can't agree about whether um, a bill should become law. This statute provides a, uh, a way of resolving that disagreement. Um, it also provides a, a foundation for various um, laws, statutes that have been created since, including um, a later Parliament Act, the Parliament Act of 1949. So, yeah, that was... Sorry, go ahead, Adam. No, please. I was just going to ask uh, Farah um, about the implications of your theory for the function of courts. So in the quasi-entrenchment of constitutional statutes, one of your two papers that we're discussing today, you say something about uh, how courts should, should uh, interpret or not constitutional statutes. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Richard. And, and sorry, my computer crashed, so that's why I disappeared for a while. Uh -huh. um, so, so, yeah, I mean, one thing that we've been interested in in both papers is what constitutional statutes should mean for what courts should do, because I think there was, and, and maybe Adam covered some of this when I was, uh, when I was uh, offline, but we think that a couple of things that have been happening are quite interesting. One is that all of this that's happening in the UK is against an orthodoxy where constitutional status of a statute didn't matter, right? So traditionally, courts weren't supposed to look at a statute and say, oh, is this constitutional or is it not constitutional, and use that uh, to make a decision one way or the other. And the fact that this is happening now, the fact that you have landmark <coughs> cases like, like Actor Team or Thorburn, the fact that judges are taking into account the constitutional status of a statute is significant. But at the same time, judges haven't been clear about the theoretical basis for their treatment, right? So they're treating constitutional statutes as special in some way, they're treating them as different in some way, but they're not making it clear why they're different or why they're special. 
So what we're arguing in the paper is that, um, well, I guess both papers taken together, is that it is justified for, constitution, for judges to take constitutional status as being significant in different ways. One way, for instance, is that a constitutional statute should be harder to repeal than an ordinary statute. So we're saying that if you have a situation where a constitutional statute conflicts with a later ordinary statute, then judges are justified in saying that it's not likely that Parliament intended through this ordinary statute to repeal this earlier constitutional statute. So that's one implication for what judges ought to do. And so broadly we agree with, for those interested in the, in the UK debates, but broadly we agree with what Lord Justice Laws did in Thoburn and we disagree with the judgment in H or what's sometimes called BH because Lord Justice Laws was clear about the fact that it's, it's not that a constitutional statute can never be repealed by an ordinary statute that could happen, but Parliament needs to be really, really clear. And the problem with each was that case was suggesting that Parliament just could never repeal could never use or, you know, except by using express words, they could never repeal a constitutional statute. And the other, the other way in which we think judges are justified in treating constitutional statutes, especially, is that we think that a constitutional statute, if a constitutional statute uh, conflicts with an earlier ordinary statute, then judges shouldn't read down or read more narrowly that constitutional statute because of the earlier ordinary statute. So they should give that constitutional statute its, its full breadth, its full effect, even though it conflicts with an earlier ordinary statute. So, so this is, these are our implications for, for what judges ought to do. So how does Parliament go about um, enacting a constitutional statute? Can it do that? Uh, or may we only identify constitutional statutes retrospectively uh, uh, in terms of their, their effect? and the importance that we ascribe to it once it is passed and once we see how it interacts with the rest of the legal constitutional infrastructure? Mm. That's such an interesting question. I, I think that we're, we want to give a sort of a, um, we want to say that most of the time uh, Parliament can't decide initially whether a statute is going to be constitutional or not. It can only pass the statute and hope for the best. Uh, hope that it that it becomes constitutional, and th and the reason for that is that although Parliament can can settle on the subject matter of a statute and say, okay, now we're going to set out to regulate some institution, what it can't do is it can't determine at the outset its complete importance. It can it can say, okay, we're going to give this institution certain powers, or we're going to prohibit it from doing certain things, but what it can't do is it can't say there are these laws that are going to come to depend on this statute or this statute is going to make such and such a difference to these other laws' interpretation and meaning. Because all of that hinges on what comes next, what other laws are developed, what future statutes are, are enacted. So Parliament can, can lay the foundation, but it depends on, on the decisions of legal actors going ahead, whether that statute is going to have the importance that it needs to have to actually have constitutional status. So this is not a not a how-to guide, I guess, for Parliament about how to create a, um, a constitution. Um, basically, how Parliament can add one of the ingredients, um, and then it's up to up to later legal actors to, to add the rest. Yeah. So it's not a it's not a roadmap for political actors uh, as to how to enact a constitutional statute. But I want to come back to one point that you just made, Adam, and perhaps Farah wants to, wants to get in on this as well. You mentioned that Parliament uh, passes the law and then must hope for the best. Uh, this was in response to my question about whether, uh, whether Parliament can in fact say this is a constitutional statute. So I wonder, is it really Parliament hoping for the best? Because a constitutional statute, it does tie the hands of later Parliaments, doesn't it? And so I guess a parliamentarian um, has two hats. One is a uh, hat of the parliamentarian as a member of today's parliament. 
And the second is a parliamentarian as a member of the institution, which of course uh, uh, endures uh, well beyond her or his service as a parliamentarian. And so um, when you say the parliament must hope for the best, I, I just wanted to flag that and ask you to say a bit more about that, about uh, uh, whether we do want constitutional statutes to be recognized as such and what that does for the idea of parliamentary supremacy. You want to take so, that part? Yeah, sure, yeah. So, so, I mean, yeah, there's something a bit, it, that sounds a bit sort of cavalier about, I suppose, our, our, our position of, oh, that, you know, Parliament is going to have to hope for the best. But actually, I think it fits very well with the British constitutional tradition, right? So if you're, if you're from a constitutional tradition where you think of the constitution as, as you know, in, in your language, a master text or entrenched constitution, something that was the product of some sort of constitutional convention, then this idea of a constitution or something being part of the constitution being almost a matter of luck is, is bizarre, right? It's weird, and it seems completely unjustified. Um, but I think the way that I think the British constitutional tradition is quite different, right? It's, it's incremental. It's, um, you know, you, you pass a statute which maybe, you know, it, it hangs around for 200 years and then eventually over time it acquires this, this importance because uh, a, lot, a lot of statutes start to depend on it for its interpretation. It become, you know, so, so that, that sort of incremental organic approach to what a constitution is I can see how it would seem bizarre to some ears, but at the same time, it seems it seems the right sort of account for the British tradition. Um, and if I can just point, I mean, point out sort of one, another interesting implication of, our, of of your question is, you know, as Adam says, what it means is that sometimes you can intend to pass a constitutional statute, and you might not be successful because the importance of that statute is not sufficient. Um, but, the, but the other implication is that you can accidentally pass a constitutional statute, right? Um, so you Carter. Pass the Magna Carta would be a great example. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Did so you repeat that example? It didn't, it didn't come out clearly. What was the example? Magna Carta. Mag Magna Carta itself. Probably the, the, the first constitutional statute was itself, you know, a uh, a minor deal. I mean, this is, of course, argued over, but I mean, it's um, it certainly didn't have the sort of grand ambitions that have been attributed to it uh, by by later generations. I see. Okay, so thank you for clearing that up. So far, I continue. The the second implication is that sometimes you can pass a statute without intending it to be a constitutional statute. Go ahead, please. Yeah, so I mean, your statute might not have, it might not, you know, regulate state institutions in the grand way that we, you know, think of as constitutional. But again, over time, it might be that a lot of regulation, a lot of other uh, statutes come to depend on it in a way that means that it's, you know, it's, it, it's deeply embedded, deeply rooted um, in the legal system. Um, and, it, and it acquires constitutional status in that way. So, so yes, I mean, the implications of our understanding of constitutional statutes are, are sort of counterintuitive if you're used to thinking of constitution of a constitution in a certain way. And I think it's actually quite intuitive if you, know, you think about the British tradition. Mm, it's fascinating. Well, this is a, a good bridge, I think, uh, Farah and Adam to maybe taking a comparative perspective on this phenomenon of constitutional statutes. So there are, there are, there's a growing number of scholars who are writing about this idea of constitutional statutes or quasi-constitutionality. Um, just read a paper recently by Sergio Verdugo about the idea of quasi-constitutionality uh, in Chile. Uh, Vanessa McDonnell in Canada uh, has a paper forthcoming in the Osgood Hall Law Journal on constitutional statutes in Canada. Uh, Scott Stevenson, uh, your colleague, Farah, is uh, writing a paper on the idea of quasi-constitutionality in Australia. And of course, uh, my first point of reference for this idea, this phenomenon, uh, was the paper by Bill Eskridge and John Farajan about super statutes in the United States. And so I, 
I, I have read your papers, these two in particular, in this tradition, in this area of scholarly interest. Do you read it as well as falling into this, this category of papers? Yeah, if, should, I, should I jump in, Adam, or? Yeah, so, um, so I think, so Richard, first of all, I thought your, your workshop on quasi-constitutionality was, was an absolute eye-opener to me to think about, you know, these issues in different jurisdictions. And I think one thing that, um, that occurred to me, um, and I think a lot of us around the table at that workshop, was that, you know, this was a phenomenon, whatever you want to call it, you know, constitutional statutes, quasi-constitutionality, that, as you pointed out, is now an issue in a number of different jurisdictions, from organic laws to people thinking about super statutes and, and of course, constitutional statutes in the UK. Um, and but but the one one thing that struck me, and I think a lot of people about making comparisons, is that it did seem like there was a difference between people talking about these phenomena in jurisdictions which have an entrenched constitution and in jurisdictions which don't. And so I think that, you know, there's a lot of scope for comparison here and, you know, we, we definitely want to, uh, uh, I'm certainly interested in, in looking at the jurisdictions, um, but I think that, that what people are talking about in jurisdictions where there is an unentrenched constitution is, is different because they're, they're talking about statutes sometimes that are in some way parasitic on or in some way contribute to this, uh, to the entrenched constitutions. And it's just, it's difficult for me to think of an analogy when thinking about the UK, for instance, or thinking about New Zealand. Um, yeah, that, that was my main, my main sort of thought and comparison. Perhaps one, one analogy, uh, and I, I, I would need to think more about this. Um, could be the basic laws uh, in Israel. Mm. Yeah, I think that's yeah, I think that's right. I I I guess maybe it's worth saying that we um, in these two papers, Far and I are taking a, a kind of a basically a deflationary approach. I mean, there have been lots of grand claims about how constitutional statutes should be treated, um, and so the positive claim that we put forward is is this definition. Um, and then some, as far as mentioned, a couple of sort of modest proposals about the treatment of constitutional statutes. But these ideas that constitutional statutes should be treated sort of um, as immune from implied repeal or as sort of you know, fully entrenched, something like that, were, were quite, quite critical of these, these proposals. And then the basis for our, our modest proposals are very familiar, very traditional. Um, presumptions of statutory interpretation. So if you're looking for a, if we're looking for a, a kind of common ground across these various jurisdictions and a rationale for why quasi-constitutional statutes should be treated especially in Canada or super statutes should be treated especially in the United States or constitutional statutes in the UK, it might be that, you know, we're basically should be trying to make sense of the legislature's intention in broad terms and there are some decent rules of thumb that apply equally in all these jurisdictions uh, when it comes to figuring out what the legislature likely intended. So I think I think that would be I'm, I don't mean to speak for both of us here, but I think that would be our sort of first thought about why we see such commonality across otherwise diverse jurisdictions. I take the point as you try to harmonize maybe a lesson. Uh, from the UK, from Canada, from the US, just to use the last three examples you, you raised. I, I certainly take the point that it's, it's, it's useful um, as a way of making sense of the intent of the legislators. Hmm. I see that in the case of the UK, but in the case of Canada and the US, for example, why not just amend the Constitution? There's a mechanism to do this. Uh, and the reason why it's not possible to do in many cases is because the constitutions in both of these countries are just extraordinarily difficult to amend. And so um, the paper that I'm writing right now called Quasi-Constitutional Amendments makes the case that um, this is a way to circumvent uh, the rigid formal amendment rules in both Canada and the U.S. 
Uh, and so I take the point that, that, that you make, but I did want to just make that, that one distinction. Um, but what a fascinating pair of papers, Adam and Farah. This is, I think it, it lays the groundwork for, for some future work, maybe some responses from scholars who are writing in the field um, to critique, maybe enlarge, maybe further develop the ideas. Uh, two questions before we go. The first is, um, what are some of the open questions that are left uh, open uh, by this pair of papers on uh, the quasi-entrenchment of constitutional statutes and constitutional statutes, the two papers that we've been discussing? Uh, that's the first question. And then the second question I want to ask uh, afterward is what you're working on now, whether or not it's related to this idea of a constitutional statute. So, so first, what are some of the open questions uh, out there for, for scholars to, to think about as they mine your papers for ideas of their own? One question is the one that you just raised, um, Richard, which is um, the scope for comparison and the extent to which uh, what we're seeing here has resonance in other jurisdictions. So I think, I mean, that, that to me is, you know, um, something that we've left quite open in the paper and, and something that might be interesting to think about going ahead. I guess to me the other, if you're if you're sort of interested in domestic uh, British constitutional law, the other question is, well, what 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 in more detail counts as constitutional statute as a constitutional statute in the British context? Because we give a lot of examples, but we I don't think claim that we have a comprehensive list of all the constitutional statutes in the UK. And one thing that we do say is that we try to offer a test, but it's not, you know, it's not a perfect mechanic mechanistic sort of test. There's uh, you know, room for argument about whether this statute is in quite important enough and whether this other one is and so on. So so yeah, those are those are two open questions that come to mind. Adam? Yeah. I just yeah, just add just mentioning very quickly three, I mean, one would be, we've been talking about the legal significance of constitutional statutes, but it would also be interesting to talk about the political significance uh, of constitutional statutes. So, for example, if you knew that certain statutes were constitutional, should they have to go through, say, a different uh, enactment procedure? Should they be subject to particular scrutiny by, say, a committee, parliamentary committee? Uh, a question, too, so far I mentioned issues about conflicts between constitutional statutes and ordinary statutes. But a particularly tricky issue in Britain is what happens when two constitutional statutes conflict. It's just like it's it's a it's a tricky issue about what would happen if you get a, a conflict between two provisions of a master text constitution. That's a genuinely hard issue, um, and it arises here too. Um, and I think the the last issue is about um, other ways that perhaps constitutional statutes might be legally significant. So we've been talking about repeal and retrenchment. Um, but there was a suggestion at one time in Britain that constitutional statutes should be interpreted especially generously and purposively. Um, and you had a similar idea floated in Canada at one time. Um, that's not that away in Britain, but uh, maybe it was just missed too quickly. So uh, a lot of opportunities, I think, to continue the conversation uh, that you've entered with these two important papers. Before we go, uh, what are you guys working on, either together or separately? Farah? Well, together we're working on a paper that that we're quite excited about. Um, it's on it's on standing. It's on the uh, on standing in public law, and I guess more particularly administrative law. Um, and we're asking basically we're we're trying to provide an account of standing that takes into account of that that relates standing to civic virtue. And we're arguing that um, judges are testing for civic virtue in the way that they. Uh, grant standing, particularly in public interest cases. Hmm, interesting. Adam? Uh, well, another thing that we're thinking about uh, working on next is also about uh, the foundations of constitutions and um, specifically how to identify constitutional principles. Um, so, <laughs> so if we could figure out, if we could map the British Constitution, one thing we'd, we'd map is constitutional statutes, but we'd also try to figure out uh, what makes certain principles constitutional, um, and what distinguishes constitutional principles from, say, legal principles. Um, so that's something that we're looking ahead to, though. 
I think we're uh, <laughs> we're aware of the challenges in that and uh, taking on such a big topic. Well, I wish we could continue the conversation to to start right there uh, on that paper, <laughs> but uh, but I'm 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 sensitive to the fact, Adam, that it's uh, just after ten o'clock, maybe ten thirty your time where you are, uh, maybe bedtime. Certainly would be for me, but maybe not for you. But uh, I want to thank you both for for this interesting, fascinating conversation. Uh, on constitutional statutes, your work uh, in the field, these two papers that we've highlighted, the first, the quasi-entrenchment of constitutional statutes, and the second, constitutional statutes. And just a reminder, we've been here with Adam Perry of the University of Oxford, Faculty of Law, and Farah Ahmed of Melbourne Law School, and it's been a great pleasure for me, uh, two of my dear friends, uh, to have this conversation with you. So thank you very, very much. Well, thank you for the kind words, Richard, and the great questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Richard. This was fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.